Well, hello there, my friend Jonathan Doyle with you once again. Welcome aboard to the Catholic Teacher Daily Podcast. I'm pleased you are here. Thanks for checking in. Hope you're doing well. And as always, we always say here, thank you for the work that you are doing day in and day out in Catholic education. It's such a challenging time in world history. I'm sure that uh, people all throughout human history have made the same observation, something along the lines of, I never thought that I would see times like this. I was thinking the last couple of days about that great line from uh, Lord of the Rings where Gandalf and Frodo are talking and Frodo realises the enormity of the task before him and says to Gandalf, you know, I, I wish that I hadn't had to live through such times. And Gandalf says to him, well, so does everybody that lives through times like this. But he says that it's not up to us to decide the times in which we live. It's up to us to decide what we do with the time that is given to us. So often in you know, seminars when I'm doing staff professional development, I'll often talk about that. I'll say, look, there are so many challenges that we face in Catholic education due to the cultural forces arrayed against us. But unfortunately, we don't get to choose the time when we are born. We only get to choose to respond with the time that we are given. And I'm speaking, uh, yeah, I've got a big event coming up in a few weeks with a lot of Catholic teachers, and I'm thinking of that scripture from Esther. It talks about being born for a time such as this. That often we can look at some of the challenges and think, why did we end up getting born at this moment? Why do we have to deal with all this complexity and these challenges and problems in our schools, in our culture? And I guess the inverse way of looking at that is to say, well, maybe we were specifically chosen for this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because of that, we're going to do the best we can with what we've been given. And, you know, remember in those farewell discourses in John's Gospel, Jesus promises that he would not leave us as orphans. It's a beautiful line, isn't it? That he would not leave us as orphans, that he would send the counsel of the paraclete to be with us. And that's good news. So uh, despite the evidence of your eyes at times when things seem insurmountable or, you know, the specific cultural forces at the moment that we face in what they call liquid modernity in a postmodern secular world, you know, those forces can seem so well organized, so well resourced, so powerful. But remember this church of which you were a part started with 12, well, I guess Judas Judas didn't uh, didn't stick around too long, but uh, at least 11 very ordinary people. Very ordinary people. And as the young church grew, it was a church very much in the early days of very ordinary men and women who did extraordinary things through the power of the Spirit. So take confidence if you ever feel overwhelmed that uh, you are in the good company of the many great men and women, the great saints, martyrs, doctors of the church, down throughout the centuries who have done remarkable things in challenging times. Now, if you've been listening to recent episodes, we've been on a bit of a journey working through Archbishop Michael Miller's Five Essential Marks of a Catholic School. And uh, he's cheating a little bit because I think we're down in uh, mark number three, but he splits mark number three into four. So I guess if you add it, all, add it all up, there'd be like eight marks of a Catholic school, nine. Maths was never my strong thing. Today we're talking about uh, this second part of teamwork and how a Catholic school is a place of community and communion. Now, the community aspect is so important. I think I talked about it in the last episode that for many of our students coming from complex, difficult backgrounds with a lot of suffering and difficulty that, uh, you know, the school community that you create can be their, their main experience of home, of family, of connection, of belonging, of coming into a place where they're accepted as they are. They're not left as they are. They're not allowed to stay as they are, but they're definitely accepted as they are each day as they grow in virtue, or at least we hope they grow in virtue due to the work that we are doing. And this concept of community and communion, you know, being in communion with each other. And what is what does that really mean? It's one of those potential word salad words that uh, get thrown around in, in, in the Catholic universe. This, uh, we are in communion. What does it really mean? Well, it essentially means that we are all in communion with Christ, that we are the thing that brings us into communion is not an ideology or a hobby or a shared set of agreements. What brings us into communion is Christ. And, you know, you think about the bishops being in communion with the bishops of Rome. 
with the Bishop of Rome. And, uh, you know, this it's important to remember that the communion is built on Christ. There is no other foundation. He is the cornerstone on which all communion is built. So, as I've been saying now for many, many years, the Catholic school is a Christological venture. And the more that we remove Christ from the absolute central place in Catholic education, the less communion we will have. We are talking today in these in this concept of community and communion uh, on teamwork, and that was yesterday's uh, content. Today we're talking about uh, what Bishop Archbishop Miller talks about in the cooperation between educators and bishops. This is something that doesn't get talked about very often. Uh, the times that I've had to talk about it have usually been uh, a moment when there can be an awkward silence in the room, at least in my country, Australia, uh, less so in other parts of the world. But the awkward silence has come when I've gently and as pastorally as possible reminded everybody in the room, every educator there, that our authority to teach in a Catholic school is derived By that I mean that nobody gets to just walk into a Catholic school. Like you might go and get a teaching qualification. You you get a secular teaching qualification from a, or even a a Catholic university. Let's just say that you are a qualified Catholic educator or a qualified teacher, at least legally. That does not mean that you can simply walk into a Catholic school and teach in a Catholic school. You don't have the authority to do that. So where does it come from? You know, it doesn't, just because you are a baptized Catholic per se, and I know that often many listeners may not be um, a baptized Catholic, and I know that in our schools, at least here in Australia, we'll have many uh, fine educators who are not baptized Catholics. But even being Catholic doesn't give you authority. No one gets, just by virtue of baptism, no one has permission or a right to teach in a Catholic school. So where does it come from? Well, it's actually derived it's derived from the what they call the local ordinary or your local bishop. So the local bishop is the one who is the chief teacher in the diocese. And it's called, in Latin, it's called the munus docendi, the munus docendi, which is the office of teaching. And in Catholic trivia, office doesn't mean a physical room in which you have desks and chairs. Office means like a role or a, a task. So the task of teaching. So the bishop is the chief teacher in a diocese. And our right to teach in a Catholic school is a participation in that teaching office. So you've got the chief teacher of a diocese, and then you've got all of us who are also teaching in the diocese with an authority derived from that chief teacher. You know, where I live, the archbishop constantly refers to himself in homilies as the chief evangelist of the diocese. I like that because I think it's it's a you know it's great to have that constant focus on evangelization. I like how he says it, the chief evangelist. I am the chief evangelist. At least he understands his role and takes responsibility for it. I like that. And then he reminds us all that we are to participate with him in that role of evangelization. So it's it's important to understand with this that the Catholic Church is not to be constructed in your mind as a vast global corporation in which your diocese is like a branch office. That's kind of the crass terminology that's often used to to sort of think about how the Catholic Church operates. It's very different to that. It's about this communion piece that throughout the history of the church, bishops have been sent to geographic regions to increase communion with the Bishop of Rome and communion with the global church, the Catholic church, Catholic, Catholic, of course, meaning universal. So, you know, Jesus very clearly in Matthew 28 tells us to go to all nations and make disciples. So the church, being obedient to Christ, um, has gone to the ends of the earth geographically and established geographic regions in which the faith is preached, in which people, in which healing is offered, which people are taught the faith, and bishops are established in each of these geographic regions to, I guess, to do many different things, but primarily this office of teaching to make sure that the, you know, can you imagine, I mean, look, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but, you know, the, the one of the challenges after the Reformation was that you have a vast number of other Christian churches whose doctrine will vary quite significantly, right? 
Now, please don't hear this the wrong way. Don't hear this as any form of Catholic triumphalism or because Karen and I and our family have been incredibly blessed by, uh, you know, our Protestant brothers and sisters over many, many years. But what I'm pointing to is one of the beautiful things for me about the Catholic Church is the doctrine is universal uh, at best. You know, often there's all sorts of tension and, and uh, controversy at different times. You go back to Paul VI, Humano Vitae, of course, you get all these different moments in Catholic history where there's challenges and problems and difficulties. And, and, uh, but isn't it amazing to see after 2,000 years that the Spirit has kept her, the Church on the journey? that we haven't gone flying off into bizarre forms of doctrine contrary to the apostolic tradition uh, or the deposit of faith or the witness of Christ in the Gospels. So that communion is a beautiful thing. So your diocese, your bishop, is the one who is hopefully ensuring communion with that global church. And look, I, I just say to you that over the many years that I've been traveling the world speaking, it's been just incredible to witness the universality of the church. You know, Karen and I, in the ministry we've had over the years, we've experienced mass everywhere, from the jungles of Bougainville to Iceland to all across the US and Europe and even in the Middle East and, of course, Australia and New Zealand and uh, in Asia. And it's just amazing that you go into Mass, and it might be a little bit different. I remember being in Bougainville, the, the men and the women are separated. So the men sit on one side of the church, and the women sit on the other. And it's just incredible to see. And you go in there, and the women are dressed so beautifully. They're just, you know, there's so much poverty in Bougainville, but they just dress beautifully. And then the men on the other side, and the singing was amazing. And then I remember going to Iceland, and um, Iceland's a deeply Protestant country. It's a very secular country, but it's Protestant in its uh, in its faith expression. And so I had to hunt to find this beautiful old Catholic cathedral. I remember it so clearly. Heard one of the greatest homilies of my life there from a young Franciscan priest. And, you know, just that you go to all these different places, but you experience this beautiful communion. So, excuse me for going on a rabbit hole here with my musings about the beauty of communion, but Let's bring this back to what today's episode is supposed to be about, which is our relationship with the local bishop. So I just wanted to say to you that having met, worked with, spoken closely, had dinner with so many bishops around the world, can I remind you of a couple of things? They are human. They are human. They're human beings. They are human beings and they are diverse. You get, you know, think about what happens. Many of them, you know, there's definitely ambitious people and priests and seniors who are desperate to become a bishop and some of them can be quite political creatures and they do get promoted and and off they go and uh you know that's that's how they've approached things and uh, you know who knows and then you find these incredibly pastoral men and you just find this whole range of humanity and many of them are often sort of thrust into the roles of bishops and it's an incredibly complex demanding role involving finance, administration, human resource management, dealing with, you know, and as a bishop, and I can say this because my mother was an archbishop secretary for 25 years, and so much of the time, you know, there's not a lot of thanks. Your day is spent putting out one fire after another and, uh, you know, trying to find time for just recreation and well-being and personal health and fitness and good nutrition and good habits and then friendships. It's its living in a strangely rarefied atmosphere. And, you know, its I think I say this because I want us to do as best we can in the various contexts in which we're in to be supportive of bishops as much as we are able. And let's be honest, there's some, there's some less than ideal bishops. And, um, and uh, the extremes, you've got some bishops who are, instead of being shepherds, they're they can often, you know, I think Pope Francis talked about this, they can be more like wolves preying on their own flock. And that's rare, right? So let me say that, that's rare. So in our Catholic schools, we derive our teaching from the teaching office of the bishop. And I just want you to have some compassion and pray for your local bishop, because as I read through Archbishop Miller's bits and pieces here on bishops, the, the role they have, like they've got to be 
you know, they've got to be across all the curriculum. They've got to be across all the pedagogy. They've got to be across as best they can. Who are the people teaching in their schools? Who's leading their schools? What are the staff like? Um, they've got to be dealing with parents. So this is this complex, difficult task that they face because at the end of the day, they are ultimately responsible for the Catholic faith within the geographic region um, that is apportioned to them. Uh, so I'm looking just through the document here and seeing if there's anything that really jumps out. Um, you know, they've got to be responsible for the formation of teachers and, uh, and l listen to this bit here. They should, uh, we're looking for close cooperation in fostering a school's Catholic Catholicity. It's a time honored ecclesial practice. And it says here, a spirituality, a spirituality of communion should be the guiding principle. Without this spiritual path, all external structures of cooperation serve very little purpose. They would be mere mechanisms without a soul. So you see this beautiful uh, possibility here of a cooperation between bishops and staff. It says here that the bishop's responsibility is twofold. First, the bishop must integrate the schools into his diocese pastoral program. That's, you know, look at that con that that. that content there like that the bishop's responsible for for making sure that catholic education is embedded in the wider pastoral program of the entire diocese which is the salvation of souls right and it says here second he must oversee teaching within them john paul ii said bishops need to support and enhance the work of catholic schools so it's really case by case. You've just got some great bishops out there doing awesome stuff, but whether you've got the greatest bishop in the world or you're not a fan of your bishop, what you can do is pray for them. And I mean that, I really do. And reach out to them, like, you know, invite them to your school. Like a lot of the times we just think that they're so busy that they, you know, they're too busy to do X, Y, and Z. But honestly, consider inviting them to your school. Say, hey, we'd love you to come. We'd, we'd like you to visit. We want, you know, we want to put on a lunch with the kids and you get to meet it and they get to meet you and some bishops do that really well. So so friends, in summary, what a what a great, big, vast, complex, beautiful, messy thing Catholic education is. Full of humans, right? You put a whole bunch of humans together and all sorts of craziness is going to happen. But what if we're all put together and we're given the gift of faith and we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit entrusts pastors oversee the task some of these pastors can be absolutely fantastic and we need to pray for them and we need to uh we need to be grateful for the good ones and um yeah so that's all i want to say today find out more about your local bishop invite him into your school and uh and pray for them and thanks so much again for what you're doing every single day it does make a significant difference to the world uh, really praying for you i I just, after all these years, still cannot let go of this deep belief that Catholic educators can make the most profound difference to the lives of young people. All right, my friend, would you do me a favor? Please make sure you've subscribed to this podcast. Hit that subscribe button. It does make a big difference. Share this with other colleagues if you can. There's a whole bunch of links here. My new website's just come out. You can find me, of course, daily on YouTube and a bunch of other places. Instagram, Facebook, all those interesting places that I don't spend a huge amount of time on if I can help it. But thank you so much for what you're doing. My name is Jonathan Doyle. This is the Catholic Teacher Daily Podcast. And I'll have another message for you tomorrow.